Thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming before the committee today um, to highlight the importance of assisted technology. And I was particularly struck by how you outlined the crucial role it can have in communication, but as well as just the reminder of the kind of basic importance of communication in dignity of the individual and capacity to live as independently as possible. Unfortunately, we know that the reality in Ireland is that many people don't have access to technologies that could help transform their lives. To realise our commitments under the CRPD, we need systems and resources to ensure everyone who needs assisted technology or equipment receives it. Um, I have quite a few questions. I don't know if, if there's not time. Written replies would be great as well. But first, for the Irish Association of Speech and Language Therapists, um, you explained the role of augmentative and alternative communication, which can be used to supplement or replace speech and the variety of cases where it may be used by individuals across their lives. However, that requires them to be able to access your services and support as speech and language therapists. So I'm wondering if you can give us a sense of how long people have to wait before they can get to see you and the timescales involved between you recommending a form of AAC and the person getting the necessary equipment and technology. Um, you also highlight the many issues with progressing disability services and that's a frequent topic of conversation here in this committee and in the Children's Committee. Um, and you point out that in some cases there's no local access to specialist supports for children and families. Um, so you spoke a bit about like retention and placements and we know that a lot of people are leaving the disability sector in general and we, the, you know, the children's disability network teams are almost seen as a place people don't want to work and a lot of work needs to be done I think in that area. Um, and having worked in disability support services for years I think a kind of a campaign really around how rewarding it actually can be and a kind of plan in place and funding, multi-annual funding, all of those things that we, that people really feel like the service is going to improve and that it'll be a nicer place to work is so important. But what, from your perspective, needs to happen for the development of those pathways um, and then ultimately for clients to be able to access the AAC supports? Um, you mentioned that in October, it's AAC Awareness Month and the larger societal change is necessary to improve understanding of AAC. Um, could you outline maybe measures or policies that state bodies should have to ensure the equal and active participation of people who use AAC? Um, and then for uh, Professor McLaughlin, um, you discussed the role of new legislation on AT and AAC, recognising them as cross-cutting mediators of human rights and ensuring a more systematic and appropriately funded approach across sectors. Um, could you elaborate on what you mean by this and the difference such legislation would make? You also mentioned development of an, assisted, an assistive product list for Ireland. Could you also just discuss for the committee the significance of that? And you referred to the concept of a justice-orientated digital framework which considers how fair access to digital capabilities and infrastructure can reduce inequality. Could you outline what that would look like and its increasing importance for the committee? Thank you. Okay, will we start with Malcolm and then back to Yvonne or Miriam? Okay, thank you very much for the questions. Um, so maybe if I start with the, the last point. Um, uh, so, so, so this particular work uh, from Anuth um, University has been led by my colleague uh, Katrina O'Sullivan and um, recently published in the, in the journal uh, Nature where one of uh, we're arguing that the provision of assistive technology um, and digital technologies um, has to take into account uh, w one the physical provision of those, um, but also the governance uh, around those, and particularly the potential for exploitation of people, um, and the fact that many of the algorithms which um, are developed around digital technologies are, if you like, normed on the, the average person in the population, whereas um, often with uh, digital technologies uh, and assistive technologies, we want to promote the inclusion of those people more uh, on the margins. So, uh, for instance, if we leave the development of uh, these technologies solely within commercial hands, then they they obviously go for, for for the bulk in terms of where they can make the money. Um, whereas if if there was a much stronger um, social consciousness involved in it, for instance, uh, with national legislation, we could require 
appropriate um, sampling and, and sourcing of people to um, feed into algorithms so that they're appropriate to a much, much broader range of people. Um, you, you know, an, an example, I was talking about the iPhone uh, earlier, um, but just in, in, there's a lot of work around the sort of gendered element of um, phones, so that some phones are, are designed so that they're uh, appropriate for men's hands, but they're not appropriate for women's hands. Um, so that that's like a really crass example of what's seen as a mainstream technology. Um, this, the same applies, but in, in a much more severe way when it means that people can't even access the, the technology. So we should be requiring, um, you know, like, like we're the European hub for all of these digital multinationals. And um, I think Ireland could show fantastic sort of global leadership by bringing them together, getting them to, to, to sign up to, to sort of principles around uh, just uh, digital in terms of governance, in terms of how they develop. Um, uh, new technologies, um, the the involvement of, of users, and, and so on. Um, I'm very happy to share the, the paper um, with the members of the committee, and I put it there on the link uh, that's provided in the uh, opening statement. But as I say, my colleague Katrina O'Sullivan in Maynooth is the person who's led out on that work. Um, the assistive product list um, for, for Ireland. So an assistive product list is basically modelled on what uh, elsewhere is called an essential medicines list. Um, so essential medicines list was introduced to try and make those medicines that are most frequently required uh, to make those available in bulk so that they can be purchased more uh, cheaply and more reliably. Um, so the assisted product list has the same idea. Um, it identifies 50 different types of assistive products, including um, AAC, which are seen to be uh, the, the absolute minimum that a country is required to provide. Um, and by developing that list, um, you, you know that you have uh, continuity of, of supply, uh, etc. One of the drawbacks with the list is that there's a danger the countries say, OK, we're only providing those 50 products. Um, so one has to sort of safeguard against that. But uh, many countries, including many very poor countries, have now developed assistive product lists, and they are um, promoting greater access. So for, for instance, in um, uh, Pakistan, where they've developed an assistive product list, there's um, some provinces in Pakistan where people in, as I say, this extremely poor country are actually having free access to um, assistive technologies. So I, I think if, if we were able to have an assistive product list in Ireland, um, we could at least prioritize those um, and then look at how we can make sure that we're not excluding people who, who aren't um, using the, the products in, in that um, priority product list. Um, so the, uh, I think the different legislation would, would make um, uh, again, I think if we're going to be real about the rights of people within the, the CRPD and the, the, the right to participate and the, the right of access and, and so on, um, then we need legislation that sort of builds that in. I know this committee is aware um, in terms of the Disability Act and how it entitles one to an assessment but doesn't entitle one to an intervention. Um, I, I think... There's, there's a real danger here in Ireland that assessments um, will be increasingly moved into the private sector and people will have less access to them. So I think it would be very important to have legislation that establishes not only should people have an appropriate assessment for assistive technology, but they also are entitled to the appropriate intervention, i.e. the technology itself and the ongoing maintenance. There, there are many cases that you'll be familiar with where people get an initial prescription for assistive technology, um, but then when that technology needs renewed, um, they, there's not funding available uh, for them. This is a, a terrible, uh, terrible situation, literally giving something to someone and then taking it uh, away from them. Um, so I, I think unless these things are on a, a legislative basis, and that um, whether it's the HSE or Department of Education or whoever is, is compelled 
to meet those requirements, then with the other demands on services, the, the, those requirements simply won't be met, and I, I believe that's unacceptable. Uh, Yvonne, or... I'll address maybe the waiting list uh, question first. I, I don't have figures here. I think we, we do know that the waiting lists are very long and they are having a big impact, I think, right across the country at this stage. Um, and I suppose from an AAC perspective, the big concern there is if you're waiting for speech and language therapy, uh, there's frustration building, uh, there's no, having no way to communicate, the problem gets bigger and the need gets bigger. So I suppose if we could get in and provide speech and language therapy early when someone has that need before they've experienced that frustration, it's an easy, it's going to need less intervention. So I suppose it's not just the AAC assessment that's getting in for that speech and language therapy early. Um, so I think the waiting lists are a very, very significant issue. And I think they also affect the retention piece. Speech and language therapists want to work with families, they want to work with individuals and help them achieve their potential. But a lot of our speech and language therapists are firefighting, they're managing these waiting lists and they're telling people they can't have the service. And that is really demoralising for speech and language therapists. They're not going to stay in posts where they can't do what they want to do. So I think waiting lists has to be the first thing we address. And then looking at that retention piece coming on from that, we need proper clinical supervision, mentoring and support within clinical specialist areas. We need access to continuing professional development to let um, therapists really build their skills and then use those skills to, to, the, to uh, their best um, ability to help people achieve their potential. And then uh, Maren's going to talk a little bit on the prescription piece, so I won't go into that, but I did also just want to talk about that society change. I think we need people with communication disability being in all the conversations we have so that they can say, well, no, actually, the way you're looking at that problem doesn't include me and it doesn't um, address my needs. There's lots of initiatives we can take, but we need to have their voices uh, in there so that we do it in an appropriate way. Some of the uh, initiatives internationally we've seen Canada have developed a system of communication intermediaries. So if you're in the justice system and you have a communication disability, there's someone there to support, to analyze what's happening in terms of communication and ensure that you're not prejudiced or discriminated against within the justice system. We don't have anything similar here. We look at Australia, um, recently there for a, a conference and they, um, it was around communication disability. <coughs> so they trained every service provider on the Gold Coast in communication accessibility. They certified them, they tested them, they made sure that everybody was able to communicate right. in an appropriate way and make sure all their services are accessible. We need things like that here. Our police service needs support and training. If you look at every facet of society, there's that we need to make change, but it's getting people with communication disability in there in how decisions are made so that we can reflect their needs within that. Just before we move on yeah. the, uh, is it okay if I ask? because obviously with the timescales, like if you don't have the figures, we don't have them. Yeah. Um, but just for the commission to have an understanding of where we're at in terms of it, if you, I, don't worry if you can't, but like, is there like a kind of worst case scenario in terms of how long somebody's waiting and then best and what's the ideal and maybe the kind of general average and then also the timescales involved between you recommending a form of AAC for somebody and then them getting it. So not just the waiting list for seeing the speech language therapist, but actually getting the technology. I think that there's a difference across the country for the yeah. wait lists and I, and I wouldn't know um, what exactly they are. Um, it would only be anecdotally okay. um, and I, I don't, to, to go into that, we yeah. can all guess that. Um, in terms of prescriptions, um, when um, people come for, eventually get to see speech and language therapists or the team around a prescription for an AAC device, the best um, practice would say that people should trial three different devices at least or trial different devices and different supports so that they can be involved in choosing what best fits their need once it, the assessment has taken place and there's, there's an identified pathway. Um, <coughs> One of the um, time eating things around that is that when we go to look for devices, loan devices then for people to try out and see if, how it will work for them, we're approaching companies in the UK largely um, to check when the device will be available and we're working to that timeline. So from when a person comes for an assessment and devices for, are recommended for loan, there can be a huge gap. And then there's a timeline that's different across the country. There's no national process for funding of devices. So depending on where you live, as Max said, it's a geographical lottery, really, how long it takes for you to get that device.